Local support for this program is provided by Maine Public Member Contributions and by Memic, a workers' compensation insurance company celebrating more than 25 years of serving Maine employers and their employees. Dedicated to a balanced workers' compensation system that reduces injuries and keeps costs down. Memic.com. The Law Offices of Joe Bornstein. From Kittery to Caribou, the Joe Bornstein team is committed to serving injured and disabled Mainers in locations convenient to them. Learn more at JoeBornstein.com. AARP Maine, helping Mainers cast their votes safely and providing information about different voting options. Learn more at AARP.org slash votes. Good evening, and welcome to Maine Public's Your Vote 2020 U.S. Senate Debate. I'm Jennifer Rooks, and we are live at the Augusta Civic Center. For the next hour, we will hear from the four candidates in the race on a range of front burner issues, with help from Maine Public's senior political correspondent, Mal Leary, and chief political correspondent, Steve Missler. A few notes on tonight's setup. We are in the auditorium of the Augusta Civic Center to provide safe space for both the candidates and our crew. The candidates are standing 10 feet apart. Our moderators are separated by plexiglass. There are no spectators other than our own crew and a few campaign staffers and also a handful of journalists who are masked and safely distanced. Now, let's meet the candidates in an order determined before the program by a random drawing. Republican Senator Susan Collins, the incumbent in the race, is seeking her fifth term in office. Sarah Gideon of Freeport is a Democrat who serves as Speaker of the Maine House of Representatives. Lisa Savage of Solon is a retired school teacher and union organizer. She's a member of the Green Independent Party, but is running as an independent. And Max Lynn of Bar Harbor, running as an independent, is a retired financial planner. Tonight, we will ask each of the candidates questions that have been crafted specifically for them by our new staff, but that will allow them to explain their positions on major topics. The candidates will each have 90 seconds, a minute and a half to respond, and we will grant opportunities for 15 seconds for rebuttals when warranted. Also, because of the distance here, Mal and Steve and I are going to try to project. We are not yelling. We're going to trying to make sure that everyone can hear what we're saying. The first round is on the Supreme Court nominee confirmation process underway in the Senate this week. In the same order of introduction, we go first to Susan Collins and our own Steve Missler. Senator Collins, you have said that you, will, you do not believe that President, Trump, President Trump's nominee, Amy Coney Barrett, should have a confirmation vote before the election and you will oppose her for that reason. But do you believe that she is a qualified nominee? First of all, good evening, and thank you for hosting this event tonight. Before Justice Ginsburg died, I made very clear that I thought it was important for us to be consistent and follow the precedent that was established four years ago and be fair to the American people and not have a vote on a Supreme Court nominee before the election. Four years ago when Justice Scalia died, it was very early in the year, and I felt that we could do it, but my view did not prevail, and thus the president has been established. So I have not approached the merits of Judge Barrett at this point, what I have concentrated on is being fair, and I don't think it's fair to have a vote prior to the election. Now, I do want to mention that my opponent, Sarah Gideon, has an ad on TV that says that I, that I supported 181 far-right judges. Well, I want everyone out there to know that 84% of those judges had bipartisan support. 
they included a judge proposed by her mentor, Chuck Schumer from New York State, who was confirmed by 99 to zero, a very misleading and unfair attack. My follow-up is, All right. you, yeah. yeah, I just have a quick follow-up. Some people have criticized you of taking this position as a political calculation. Can you just respond to that criticism? Well, it's clearly not a political calculation since it does not make uh, a lot of people happy. Uh, it, it's a matter of principle. It's a matter of fairness. In a democracy, we should play by the same rules. And the fact is that there has not been the confirmation of a Supreme Court justice in a presidential election year since 1932. We should wait till after the election. Thank you, Senator Collins. Now a question for Sarah Gideon by Mal Larry. Uh, Sarah Gideon, some Democrats are calling for certain reforms of the Supreme Court and in fact the federal judiciary in general adding justices to the Supreme Court, term limits, you've opposed those. Uh, but in doing that, do you have any ideas for making the process become less politicized? Yes, good evening, Mal. Thank you for the question. Good evening, Jennifer and Steve, and welcome to all the Mainers who are watching this evening. I'm glad you asked this question. It's an incredibly important one because having three functioning separate but equal branches of government is essential to all of us. And that means having an independent judiciary, one that is not politicized. However, as we know, and as we are talking about right now, we do have a judiciary that has been politicized. President Trump had a concerted and successful effort to move the judiciary to the right. He has done that with the help of Mitch McConnell and with the help of Susan Collins. Those 181 judicial nominees that she chose to confirm, some of them were rated unqualified by the American Bar Association, and some of them came with distinct social and political agendas. Now, you're right. I have looked at the proposals that are out there, and I have said, if I cannot look through the lens of an independent judiciary, I am very skeptical about whether they should be put into place. How do I think we should get back to an independent judiciary? Number one, I think we should make sure that we have a Senate that is focused on making progress for people. Number two, I think we should go back to having uh, a filibuster in place for judicial nominees. Thank you. All righty. Uh, Lisa Savage, a question from Steve Missler. Uh, you have said you might consider term limits for Supreme Court uh, nominations, but for how long would those terms be? And are you worried that if term, limit, term limits were imposed, that that would just uh, basically politicize the process even more, that there would be campaigns every time a judge or justice is up? Thank you for the question. Thank you for inviting me tonight, and thank you for everyone in the audience. Thank you, fellow candidates. Um, I do believe there should be term limits in place for Supreme Court justices. When the rules were put in place for them to be lifetime appointments, the average life expectancy of an American was 39 years old. We're now up to 79 years old. I think that a, a reasonable length of term limit would be 18 years. Um, I don't see that it would politicize the process more, uh, knowing that term limits were coming up. It, in a way, it would be hard to imagine a more politicized process than we see now. Um, the Senate has gone home, uh, leaving a pandemic relief bill unaddressed, but they're continuing to hear a judicial hearing after the election is well underway. I think we've seen 13% of people in Maine have already voted. So to... Um, uh, you know, not address the very urgent needs of the American people to get through this pandemic and this economic downturn while trying to ram through a uh, Supreme Court nomination here at the 11th hour of uh, the first term of the current president, I think is a very politicized process and not serving us well. Um, so I do believe that um, the American people also don't appreciate having the Supreme Court um, nominations be a sort of political football. It is a serious, um, you know, decision. It's a serious task. And I wish that the Senate would 
take all their uh, duties more seriously. Just a quick follow-up, if I might. The 18 years that you have cited has also been cited by some scholars uh, who have listed a bunch of pros and cons of that particular term limit. The cons are that most people think that, or some people think that the lifetime appointment actually protects the judges from political pressure because they, they can outlast presidents or senators, for example. What do you think of that argument? Well, I think that 18 years is plenty to outlast a president, since a president at most could serve eight years. Um, I don't really see that, you know, most people that uh, ascend to the Supreme Court are already fairly advanced in age. They're, they're not elderly, but they, they are adults and they've had a judicial career behind them. So adding 18 years onto their career, I don't really see how that would politicize the process more. All right. Uh, and now Max Lynn. Mal, a question for him. Uh, Max, you said in the first TV debate that you would have, you wouldn't have voted for Justice Brett Kavanaugh, and you criticized Senator Collins for her vote. What is it specifically that you believe should have kept Kavanaugh off the bench? Well, uh, thank you for your question, Mal, and uh, it's good to be here with all of the other candidates. Uh, but it was real clear uh, what we need, in especially in Washington, is unity. And what we see is the exact opposite by the political class. The Republicans always fight the Democrats. The Democrats always fight the Republicans. We can go back to nominees from Judge Bork uh, to just when Obama was in office. There's always controversy on the other side. Uh, what I didn't like is I feel Judge Kavanaugh was qualified, but there was so much controversy in that. It really divided the country. It was such an easy time to say, no, thank you, as opposed to uh, Amy Coney Barrett, who I'm the only one up here who supports that. And we all know when or presidents are running that they will have an opportunity to appoint, uh, to appoint Supreme Court justices. We know that. And that's why the presidential election is always uh, so important, and as this one is. And I'm the only one up here. Uh, I would have supported Obama's nomination for Supreme Court. I think it's the president's job in the Constitution to do that. And, and um, you know, I... I uh, supported Susan Collins in her last time. In fact, I put up signs for Susan Collins. and uh, But it seems like this time she's completely abandoned uh, the conservative party as a political move. And I'm the only one up here supporting President Trump in his reelection, uh, supporting the Supreme Court nomination. Uh, I don't want, I'm the strongest supporter of gun rights up here. And so I ask our viewers the question is, how can a Republican today still support Susan Collins? All right, Max Lynn, thank you. Uh, Mal, do you have a follow-up? Uh, one of the big concerns about Justice Kavanaugh was his judicial temperament. Uh, right. th yeah. That came out pretty clearly during the confirmation hearings. Right. Well, what it came out was uh, that really was a more of a distraction to the people. I mean, it was outrage. I mean, we saw uh, it really that's what brought the competition from the Democratic Party when the outrage was there. And um, so, uh, and again, someone new being under the lights here and not being a career politician like uh, Susan and Sarah, there is a nervousness and there is a newness under here. So I look at Je uh, Judge Kavanaugh as a qualified person. I don't think anybody, very few people come there that aren't qualified for the job, but there was just too much uh, distraction. Thank you. And, uh, but, but with the Republican Democratic Party. Thank you. Now to the issue of COVID-19 and the government's response. Changing the order, we're going to go first to Lisa Savage with a question from Steve Missler. Uh, Lisa, you uh, believe in Medicare for all, and I believe you've called it a people's bailout and for the coronavirus pandemic. How much money would you propose giving to American families um, to help them through this, uh, this difficult time? Well, thank you for the question about a people's bailout. Um, it looks to me that many of the wealthy countries, of which we are the wealthiest, gave their families about $2,000 a month during the pandemic to meet their rent, uh, their grocery bills, their utility bills, and to try to keep um, you know, at least a roof over people's heads since we were supposed to be staying home to stay safe. I think about $2,000 a month uh, would be reasonable. Certainly, it wouldn't meet most of our household expenses that are here at this debate tonight. However, um, so far, the American people have gotten $1,200 once. And many people waited weeks or even months to get that $1,200. And college students didn't get it at all because they were still on their parents' tax returns. And many of them 
um, were working to be in school. They were, you know, they had already paid their room and board. They were booted out of their dorm. Many of them were sending money home to their families, at least here in Maine. That was the case. So I think that uh, we should have given a much more robust help to people. Uh, and we should have done it consistently on a monthly basis. And we should still be doing it. I, I believe that nearly one in four workers in Maine lost their uh, employment when the pandemic recession hit, and many of them lost their health care at the same time as well. Those people definitely need support from the government in this health emergency. Just oh. to clarify real quick, do you mean $2,000 per person or per household? Per household. Thank you. All righty. Now we're going to go to Susan Collins with a question from Mal Leary. Uh, you've said that uh, you support more funding for the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, additional money for unemployment, for schools, for local governments. Would you support changes in the PPP that would benefit small businesses as opposed to the large corporations? As, as you well know, a lot of large corporations swooped in and took a lot of that money in the first round. Actually, Mel, I'm very proud of having been the principal author of the Paycheck Protection Program. It has provided some 28,000 small businesses, that's three out of four, in the state of Maine with $2.3 billion in forgivable loans. And what has been most important is it has helped to sustain paychecks, including benefits, for more than 250,000 Maine workers. And contrary to the implication of the question, the average size of a business that received those loans had seven employees, seven. So I'd like to see another round of PPP that would go to our hardest hit businesses, such as our restaurants and those in the tourism industry. By contrast, Sarah Gideon on April 28th put out a Facebook post in which she said, I'm personally pledging to work immediately with my colleagues to focus our efforts on getting aid to small businesses. But in fact, the legislature has been out of session since March and she has done nothing. Uh, Senator, just this afternoon, Mitch McConnell announced he will not bring uh, the president's proposal for $1.8 trillion to the floor. He won't bring the House Democrats' proposal of $2.2 trillion to the floor. He'll only bring a $500 billion package. Is that enough to provide the aid that you think is necessary? The $500 million package is a start, but it is not enough. We surely, at this time of a persistent pandemic, ought to be able to come together and produce a package. Uh, the president, as you mentioned, has said that he can go to 1.8 trillion. You know my priorities. You mentioned them in your question. They include aid to localities directly, more testing, schools, another round of PPP, help for our, our first responders and our health care providers. Those are all important. The House bill, we've had two House bills passed. One was clearly not a realistic bill that was over $4 trillion. But the more recent House bill, which is about $2.2 trillion, offers a way for us to get to a compromise. And Thank that's you. what I support. But Thank you. Senator, will you vote against that $500 billion? I'm sorry, Another I couldn't hear you. Uh, but, but will you vote for that $500 billion, billion dollar package? On the House side, another member of the delegation, Representative Golden, voted against the Democratic plan, saying it's not going to get the Republican votes. I don't want to play political games. Let's come up with a figure that works. Here's my view. I think that I would vote for anything to get the negotiations started. There's also a separate PPP bill that I've introduced. And I expect we may have a vote on that as well as the House bill and the Senate bill that you've mentioned. We need to get the negotiations underway and get relief to American families and to our health care providers, municipalities, schools, all of the priorities that I've discussed. All right. Steve Missler, question for Max Lynn. 
You've supported, um, I think, a $5,000 household payment uh, right. for coronavirus relief. If you were elected as yep. an independent, you would have to uh, find somebody, you know, colleagues to help support that measure. Mm -hmm. Which party do you think is more supportive of that level of spending? Well, thank, uh, well really, we have no conservative party and we have no small government party anymore. And as I hear uh, the other candidates up here, it's clear to me that not one of them have a clue about economics and finance. What all three of these candidates are doing is they're bankrupting America even more than it is. We heard the um, uh, opponent to my left, Lisa, talk about we're the wealthiest country. We're not. We're the most in debt country. We don't even have a secretary of treasury. We have a secretary of debt. We are a bankrupt country. We're a bankrupt state. Susan talks about the PPP program. Mel, you said it best. It, Susan, I know you put your name on it and you can't do anything, but it's been an absolute disaster. It's been cherry-picked by the big corporations. They wrote the legislation, and there's fraud everywhere in the paper. We see it. It's been a catastrophe. To answer your question, we realize that really Sarah's not running against Susan. Susan's not really running against Sarah. They're just representatives. They're the faceplates of the Republican and Democratic establishment. The true independent voice representing Maine is right here. With me as your next U.S. Senator, whether Trump is in or Biden is in, either administration will have to come to me, come to Maine, because Maine will stay all influential. We're the most influential state in America right now, and a wasted vote for Sarah Susan, Maine gives that up. So I would negotiate with whatever party's in office to get that 5,000 to every Maine family. And finally, Mal Leary has a question for Sarah Gideon. Uh, you have said that Republicans, Democrats, Independents in Maine came together in response to the pandemic. But didn't you lose the opportunity to call a special session by not narrowing the focus of that call to just dealing with the pandemic issues? It seems the Republicans were saying, we don't want to take up 400 plus bills. Thank you. Do I have an extra 15 Senate, uh, seconds to respond as a rebuttal as well? Sure. Thank you very much. So. I want to point out, first of all, that Maine has the second lowest rate of COVID infection in this country. And at the same time, Maine also on an index of zero to 100 is rated in 93 in terms of economic recovery. Neither of those things are an accident. They are about the leadership that has happened here. And that is in direct contrast to what we have seen happen on the national level with the lack of leadership from the federal government. More than 215,000 Americans who are dead and an economy overall in the nation that is in shambles. Now, here in the state of Maine, I am proud of us coming together. I've never seen Democrats, Independents, and Republicans come together so swiftly. I am sorry that my Republican colleagues got caught up in the politics of Senator Collins and the national GOP in refusing to even answer a poll to come back. But I want to just point out and ask a question because leadership matters very much. And as we have seen this failure of leadership from President Trump, and as we have seen Senator Collins simply say that his response has been uneven to COVID, and as thousands of Mainers are going to the polls and voting. Senator Collins, who has her ballot in hand, has still not told us who thinks she thinks should be leading. And this matters because it is about what you think of leadership in this country. Senator Collins it is not about people needing your advice. It is about who you are and what you think of what's happening in this country. Senator Collins, would you like to respond? I would like to respond because Sarah just talked about leadership and leadership is what I've shown in dealing with this pandemic. I came up with the concept of the Paycheck Protection Program. It is the most successful part of our response to the economic devastation caused by the coronavirus. I don't know how Sarah can stand there and claim credit for Maine having the, one of the lowest rates of COVID infections in the country. I'm very happy about that, but the fact is she hasn't been at work for six months. And her only discussion with the Republican leader in the House 
was just once during that six months, and it was less than a minute. All right, Sarah, I'm going to let you respond, and then, Mal, I'm going to have you ask a follow-up, because I know you want to. <laughs> go ahead. Um, Sarah, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for that opportunity. In fact, all legislators have worked very hard. It might be a little bit different than what we see in the Senate, where five months, more than five months after the last COVID relief legislation has come forward, as states, as municipalities struggle to keep services running, and as individuals worry about whether they're going to be able to stay in their homes, you are deflecting on the job that is not being done. All right, Mal. Do I get 15 the, seconds to respond it, to the... And just a moment, please. Just a Thank second. You. No. But my question really goes to you working with the Republicans after that first group of pieces of legislation on March 17th. And the Republican leadership on both ends of the hall tell me you just haven't talked with them, that there have not been communications. Why didn't you sit down and try to work something out? Mal, I'm sorry to say that that is simply not true. The number of times that I talk to my fellow Republican leader, I cannot even count on one hand. I can't speak to why those conversations or statements would have been made, but what I can tell you is this. All you have to do is look at my track record of eight years to see how I have worked with Republican legislators and how that is how we got things done six of those eight years, despite having somebody who vetoed most bills that came through and making progress on issues, Thank including you. in the past two years, bipartisan work to protect and expand health care, even as Senator Collins has put that health care at risk. Thank you. And uh, Lisa Savage has asked for 15 seconds to respond to Max Lynn. Go ahead. Yes. Well, I don't think that I have been bankrupting the country with my teacher salary for the last 25 years. However, I have been working very hard to bring attention to the fact that both Republican leadership and Democratic leadership vote for three quarters of a trillion dollars a year every year year after year uh, for the Pentagon budget that is what is driving the debt of this country is 20 years of war on borrowed money all right well we're going to move on to the issue of health care we are mixing up the order this time starting with Sarah Gideon Mal uh, you support a public option for health care but critics say that could put the rural hospitals in states like Maine at risk because they would likely not be reimbursed at, at adequate rates. How would your plan lower costs without threatening the viability of the rural health system? Absolutely. So let's address that criticism first because it's simply not true. Rural hospitals would not be put more at risk. In fact, we would be protecting rural hospitals, as we know, so important here in the state of Maine. We would do that, and as I have said publicly before, by making sure that we are increasing those Medicare reimbursement rates. Additionally, when we have a public option, we know that more people will be purchasing with premiums that health insurance it is a source of revenue for the federal federal government. But let's talk about health care overall for a minute, because over the course of 15 months and 35 suppers, our version of a town hall, what I have heard from people over and over again is how scared they are about their health care and their health, how scared they are right now that their health insurance is going to be taken away. That's because President Trump has made it his mission to destroy the Affordable Care Act moving forward with a lawsuit that is made able by Senator Collins vote on the tax bill, even during the course of a pandemic. That's a vote that she has said she doesn't regret at all, despite the fact that earlier in her career, she said it was her most important goal. Now, look, right now, we need leadership on the federal level, and we need to know that no matter what happens to the Affordable Care Act, we have a Congress that is in place that is actually going to protect and expand people's health care. Mitch McConnell and Susan Collins have said there is no plan in place, even as that lawsuit moves to oral arguments the week Thank after you. Election Day. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Steve Missler, question for Max Lynn. You said you don't support the Affordable Care Act, right. um, but you support some sort of public-private option. Yeah, there has to. Um, yeah, right. If you could just tell me what, what there has to be a there, hybrid. Is there a government? Uh, I think I have here? more experience again than any of uh, the other people up here in healthcare, uh, uh, and um, no one 
in America should ever lose their savings or their homes because of an illness, especially the elderly. So there has to be a hybrid system of a public-private sector. And, and this is where I feel my uh, victory in this campaign is so important because I can actually work with the Republican Party or the Democratic Party where my two opponents over to my right, Susan and Sarah, can't uh, because they're with the big party. They have no say. If, if, uh, if one of them wins, uh, what happens is uh, the power goes to the Republican leadership, uh, Mitch McConnell or um, uh, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. Uh, these two op uh, opponents here really have little to say as opposed to being independent right in the middle. I would have the strength in a negotiation to work with either a Biden administration or a Trump administration to help get the infrastructure in rural Maine for your teledoctors and telecommunication for these rural communities. And so there is no question about it when we see articles. For example, I saw one that Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi put out about Sarah Gideon, that they saw her as a rising star and they opened up their coffers. That's why they've put in $50 million. When you hear one of the parties say a rising star, the rising star will do exactly what they're told to do. Sarah will have no say. Can I just ask you real quick about your plan, sure. though? Is it, it sounds a little bit like what Sarah Gideon is yeah, proposing. Yeah, very, very similar, except Sarah talks that she supports it, but her party leadership does not. And that's where the main voters have to realize that a vote for Sarah is really not a vote for Sarah uh, and a vote for Susan and for Susan. It's a, it's a vote for the Republican or Democratic establishment. And that is why I'm running, because I think there's time and a need for an outsider in Washington politics. Thank you. Mal Leary, do you have a question for Susan Collins? Uh, you recently said that one of the reasons that you voted against the attempt to repeal of the Affordable Care Act in 2017 was because your party didn't have a replacement plan ready to be offered. Given that the ACA could be changed uh, or eliminated depending on what the Supreme Court decides after this election, what would you support for a replacement for the ACA? Well, first of all, I was the deciding vote to retain the ACA. And I've been working to protect people with pre-existing conditions since before Sarah Gideon moved to Maine. I did that when I was in state government. I think there are improvements that we can make in the ACA. For one thing, and in the Medicare program, I want to put a cap on the amount of money that seniors pay out of pocket for their prescription drugs. I think we need to reform our laws to lower the cost of prescription drugs. We need more transparency in healthcare pricing. But I want to address two things that I don't support that Sarah's called for. One is she wants to reinstate the individual mandate. The individual mandate which was in the original ACA until it was repealed, is a cruel tax on people who cannot afford to buy health insurance. It is a tax that some that 80% of the people who have paid the penalty make under $50,000 a year. She also wants a public option. That's the first step to a government takeover of our health care system, and I do not support either reinstating the tax that people have to pay under the individual mandate, nor a public option. Sarah, getting 15 seconds to respond. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. You know, what's going to happen, first of all, Susan Collins cannot have it both ways. She cannot say that she has supported pre-existing conditions when she voted for the tax bill that took the individual mandate away when she knew that that would make the bill, uh, the law potentially unconstitutional. You signed on to an amicus brief stating exactly that and that is why that lawsuit is there right now. Now, the individual mandate is gone and what I think we have learned is that it is better to have a carrot than a stick which is why with a public option I would want to include generous tax credits to make sure that we can capture those people between 133 percent of the poverty level and 400 percent of the poverty level who right now okay. cannot afford health insurance. Thank you. Uh, next to Lisa I Savage. I deserve a rebuttal. Sure. If I may. Yes. 
since Sarah did uh, criticize me in her response, let's be very clear about what the individual mandate is. It is telling someone that they may have to pay $6,000 a year for insurance, even though they can't afford it, or they have to pay a $1,000 fine. I don't think that that is right. The amicus brief that the Democrats have filed now before the Supreme Court quotes two letters that I have sent to the Justice Department saying that the Justice Department has a duty to defend the ACA because it's a duly enacted law. So, and, and when it comes to rural hospitals, the studies say that 15 of Maine's 34 hospitals would close because of the reimbursements under the public option. All right, I want to give um, Lisa Savage a chance to have a question. Go ahead, Steve. You, you support Medicare for all, but as you witnessed just now, there is a major political hurdle towards uh, achieving that. What would you support in the meantime to ensure that there's greater access to health care? Well, you know, we're looking at two parties that both accept money from health insurers. So the people that have put profit into health care and used it as made it into a commodity rather than a human right. The majority of people in Maine want Medicare for all. The majority of people in the United States want Medicare for all. Instead, we have Republicans who have no health care plan, essentially, and we have Democrats who want to make it more affordable but keep the profit in health care. The people want real health care. They don't want health insurance. They want health care that they can afford to use and that they can count on when someone in their family becomes seriously ill so that they do not lose their home or lose their life savings because of an illness. I think that if people listening to this debate would go to my website, which is lisaformain.org, and look at my health policies, I believe you will find the majority of people will agree with my approach. And if you find that you do agree with my approach to health care, you can rank me first and show that that is what you want. Having big money influence in Washington has not gotten us a health care system that we can really use and it's very expensive and has bad health outcomes compared with other nations that have a good universal health care system in place, which is most of the other nations in the world. Thank you, Lisa Savage. We are going to stop the action for just a moment and uh, take a quick break. When we come back, we hope to talk about climate change, foreign policy, and more. Stay with us. Critics have called the Choice 2020 smart as ever and never more important. Explore the Frontline Transparency Project. I think my dad would have done that differently. Where you can dig into the complete interviews exactly from the choice. Right. And Joe is always able to say, yeah, I didn't handle that quite right. Fair, trusted, and transparent. The Choice 2020. Watch an encore presentation October 27th, 9, 8 central, only on PBS. Well, we're going to have to see what happens. You know that I've been complaining very strongly about the ballots. Is America headed for a constitutional crisis? I'm being facetious. I said, what country are we in? Jelani Cobb investigates the early warnings and allegations of voter suppression. Tune in or stream starting October 20th, 10, 9 central, only on PBS. Welcome to back to Maine Public's Your Vote 2020 U.S. Senate debate. I'm Jennifer Rooks, along with Maine Public political correspondents Mal Leary and Steve Missler. We are here with the four candidates on the November 3rd ballot. Susan Collins, Sarah Gideon, Max Lynn, and Lisa Savage. And for this section, we will look at uh, foreign policy. We're going to start with Steve Missler and a question for Susan Collins. Senator Collins, uh, you voted for the 20-year-old authorization resolution that has been used, been the basis for military action in Iraq, Afghanistan, and, uh, and other conflicts. Do you regret having taken that vote? And if not, what do you believe that there should be some rest more restraints that Congress perhaps has abdicated its responsibilities to check executive use of American war power? 
I made the best decision I could at the time, and uh, I do not regret that vote. You may recall it was after the attacks on our country on 9-11, and uh, Osama bin Laden, who was the leader of al-Qaeda and led those attacks, had sanctuary in Afghanistan. So that made sense uh, to me that our troops would get involved. I would say, however, that you're raising a very important issue, and it has to do with the constitutional responsibilities of Congress versus the Commander-in-Chief. I have joined with Senator Tim Kaine, a Democrat from Virginia, in trying to make clearer the parameters of when the President can commit our troops to sustain hostilities. I think this is a very important issue. I think we need to modify the authorization for the use of military force. And I led the effort in the Senate uh, to prevent the president from committing American troops on a sustained basis in any hostilities with Iran. That's Congress's job. All right. Thank you, Senator Collins. And Max Lynn, the same Thank question you. for you. Do you believe the authorization resolution is overused? And what is your criteria for going yeah. to war? Uh, thank you. I, I, and uh, with my two uh, Republican and Democratic opponents, uh, remember, Mainers, they represent the political class, which is a warmongering machine. We've seen that in 20 years. In fact, I've brought and did the research on 24 years of Susan Collins's votes. And remember, Susan, I voted for you last time. I put signs up for you, but after researching your 24 years, there's never been a war she hasn't voted for. And interestingly enough, over the last 24 years, we've never seen more of a decline in Maine and more of a increase in jobs in China. If you look at her record, she has consistently voted to help build China. And the reality is jobs have left this country and have rebuilt China. With this right here, there's no doubt that you're helping China more than you're helping Maine workers here. Do you believe the authorization resolution is overused? Absolutely. All right, Sarah Gideon, same question. Would you like me to repeat it? No, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Congress absolutely does need to reassert its authority. The authorization uh, for the use of military uh, force is overused, especially as we see how this president has made us less safe in terms of how he conducts foreign policy, basically making unilateral decisions without consulting people in diplomacy or military experts. We need to have a foreign policy that actually is well thought out, and that is acknowledging the actual challenges in front of us today, whether that is cybersecurity, whether that is making sure that the existing nuclear stockpile is kept safely maintained, whether that's thinking about how the climate crisis or the public health crisis in front of us is able to be approached in a global manner with our allies and coalition building. Leadership matters in this case, and it's why I keep asking Susan Collins who she is voting for for president. Lisa Savage, same question. Would you like me to repeat it? No, I think I uh, remember the question. Thank you, Jennifer. So the authorization for the use of military force is not intended to last for two decades. Yes, it has been completely overused. I have a theory about why, and that is that uh, Cong Congress is abdicating its responsibility here and making it so the executive branch looks like they're holding the bag for these wars because wars are very unpopular with the American people. The American people don't want to be at war for 20 years, and we're sending working class kids to fight wars for profit. Once the United States began only manufacturing weapon systems and offshoring much of its other manufacturing capability, wars became a marketing scheme. And uh, especially a war on terror, where are the metrics that you will know when you have won a war on terror? When will you declare victory exactly? Terror is an abstract concept. It's a strategy that some people use to uh, instill fear in others and control them. So yes, I think the authorization of the use of military 
military force is much overused. Because we're mixing up, this question will be again for you, Lisa Savage. Uh, uh, topic now, climate change, Steve Missler. You're a big supporter of the Green New Deal, um, which critics have noted that because there could be some uh, tax on gas or heating oil or carbon, um, that that could disproportionately hurt people in rural uh, states like Maine uh, and low-income people. What do you say to that criticism or, or how would you offset uh, the, the potential burden that that would create for those folks? Thank you for that question. Uh, it is something that I think about because Maine, many people are struggling economically in Maine. Um, I know that the bill that's before the House now about a carbon use fee does have provisions in it to um, uh, give a rebate, so to speak, to people whose income is low enough to qualify for it. I would worry that that might not be in a timely fashion. If it only came at income tax time, that's a long time for a family in Maine to survive higher heating oil costs or higher gasoline costs. However, a demilitarized Green New Deal, such as I support, is a broad and comprehensive program that has many other aspects. One of them would be addressing the fact that the Pentagon is one of the biggest biggest uh, drivers of climate change and is the biggest consumer of fossil fuels of any organization on the planet. That needs to be addressed. We need regenerative agriculture. We need consumer owned and operated utilities. And all of those things together make up uh, the kind of demilitarized Green New Deal that I think could treat climate emergency like it's an emergency. All right. Next, a question for Max Lynn. Mal Leary. Uh, Max, most scientists argue that climate change is the biggest problem facing humanity. Do you agree with them and what should be done about it? Well, it definitely ranks up there and, and being an environmentalist, I, I, I support uh, philosophically the Green New Deal. It's just economically I don't because it, it, it'll continue to bankrupt our country. So as, a, as an environmentalist, uh, I'm the only one up here uh, actively filing a, a suit against the CMP corridor, which we feel we can stop. Maine's getting nothing out of it. At least we should get our electricity bills in half. Uh, so I do uh, support the environment. We have to stop corporate greed taking over the environment and for all people listening today it's, it's so clear we've got the political class the establishment or change and so I recommend that you vote for change first and then vote for Sarah and Susan if that's who, who, who for some reason you want but remember it's the political class against the outsider more of the same versus change it's a clear choice all right a question for Sarah Gideon from Steve Missler Speaker Gideon, you've come under some fire uh, for, from young advocates like those in the sun, uh, Sunrise Movement for not endorsing the Green New Deal. Um, what do you say to young people in Maine who want aggressive action like the Green New Deal um, and, and they're, not, they're not prepared to wait for, for something less than that? Well, thank you for that question. I agree that we need action. It needs to be bold and it needs to be immediate because climate change is here. And in fact, it is not just change. It is a crisis. I was in Stonington recently where municipal leadership was explaining how they just had built a new municipal pier and it was flooding over and over again. In Limestone, I was with a farmer experiencing extreme drought. Look, we need bold change. It's why under my leadership in the state of Maine, we came together as Democrats and Republicans to set aggressive goals to reduce carbon emissions and increase renewable energy generation. We need to do these things on the federal level. We cannot have a patchwork of states. My approach to things is to create the uh, solutions to problems together. And in the Senate, that is what I will do, making sure that we are setting those goals to reduce dirty carbon emissions by overhauling our transportation industry and infrastructure, looking at our energy grids, understanding Thank how you. we can accommodate more distributed ener energy generation, excuse me, and getting to net zero in our building as well. Thank with you, incentives. Sarah. Thank uh, you. Susan Collins, a question from Mal Leary. Uh, the Trump administration has spent the last four years trying to undo efforts of past administrations on curtailing emissions and fighting climate change, rolling back rules considered burdensome to some in the industry. If President Trump is reelected, there are fears that too much time will have gone by and we're facing catastrophic problems in the environment. Do you share that concern? And if you're reelected, what will you do about it? 
Well, Mel, I will continue to oppose the administration's efforts to roll back EPA regulations, just as I have done. I voted against rolling back the Clean Power Plan regulations, which apply to coal-fired power plants, which are so polluting. I voted against rolling back the EPA regulations on methane. I voted against uh, the president's two nominees to head uh, the EPA, including Scott Pruitt. I've also taken positive action. I've introduced a bill that has bipartisan support to increase energy storage. But what I won't do is what Sarah Gideon wants to do, and that is put a 40 cent per gallon tax on home heating oil, propane, gasoline, diesel. That would be a disaster for our families, our farmers, our fishermen. All right, we're tight on time. Sarah, if you could do it in just five seconds. Uh, very quick rebuttal. Susan Collins is saying something that's false, and she absolutely knows it. Okay, thank no, you. No, we're gonna I, I need, I, but I have to. We're going to run out of time. Is. We need to go on to the topic of racism, which many say is systemic in America and has come, you know, to the fore in the wake of the death of George Floyd and others by police. We're going to go first back to you, Sarah, and a question from Mal Leary. You uh, supported criminal justice reform, uh, banning chokeholds, eliminating profiling. Are you talking about a federal law that prohibits these practices? Thank you for that question. Yes, I am. Look, we do have a problem in this country with racial injustices, and we see it through so many of the institutions around us. That includes access to health care, access to education, rates of poverty, and the interactions of people of color with the criminal justice system. We do need to make change. We need to ban racial profiling. We need to increase racial bias training, and we need to pr ban practices that can get people killed, like chokeholds as well as creating a national database for uh, misconduct so that police officers would not be hired again in another place. All right, uh, Steve Missler, a question for Max Lynn. Thank you. You have said uh, you, you want my police tough and mean when they need to be yeah. and soft and gentle when they need to be. Yeah. So what do you do when they're being tough and mean when they don't need to be? Well, I, I'm all for, uh, uh, unlike uh, our Democratic opponent, uh, again, she has her ideas, but they don't matter. Because you know, if she's your next senator, it all goes to Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. Mm -hmm. She has no say. She'll be assigned to a committee. It's all hyperbole up here. She says they're coming together. There's been no more vicious ads. Yeah, I would and just like your to know what your situation. Yep. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, if you could just explain what what you would want. Well, yeah, to do the, the training should not come from Washington or. The training needs not come from the governor's office. It has to come from each police department. We have a majority of our police men and women are great women. There might be 1% or bad, and it's the parties, the political class that highlights those minorities. And Mainers, you're smart enough to know you've got a clear choice this November 3rd. You want more of the same? or you want change? You want political class or you want outsiders? It's crystal clear. You know what you need to do. All right, Lisa Savage, a question from Mal Leary. Uh, Lisa, you've called for demilitarizing the police. What do you really mean by that? Does that mean taking away equipment from local police departments here and across the country? Yes, Mal, that does mean taking away the equipment. The Pentagon funnels military equipment to municipal uh, police departments, and then when we see people out in the streets because they're upset that someone's been killed by the police, uh, they're you know, faced with military-grade weapons, um, tanks, uh, you know, LRAD uh, um, weapons, and things that are very inappropriate for a police force to be using for what are often nonviolent. There are people marching and they're upset that someone has been uh, killed by the police in the street. So I think that the Pentagon has used this program as a way of getting new equipment themselves. Again, it's kind of corporate welfare because Pentagon contractors are some of the wealthiest uh, corporations on the planet. And the more they sell, uh, ka-ching, the more, you know, their bottom line looks good. So I do feel that demilitarization 
militarizing the police and defunding the police and investing the money in community solutions that we know research shows reduce crime, reduce the things that lead to having, you know, a police force out with tanks pointed at American Thank citizens. Thank you. And finally, Susan Collins, a question from Steve Missler. You've said you support um, uh, criminal justice reform, but do you think that Congress should overhaul the laws around um, uh, a qualified immunity, um, which would allow uh, more civil suits against police officers who are involved in shootings that may, you know, may get them off the hook? Well, I think that we want to hold responsible individuals, and they're very few since the vast majority of police officers are brave, honorable people. Uh, but we do want to hold them responsible by charging them criminally. I'm concerned about the, uh, the liability laws, which apply more broadly. And I think the best approach is to pass Senator Tim Scott's Justice Act. It does create a national registry. That's something that there's some agreement on here tonight. So that a police officer who's been disciplined or fired for the use of excessive force can't simply go to another community and be hired without it. It also would make lynching finally a federal crime, something I've supported for a long time. And it would restrict federal funds if uh, certain reforms are not in place. But I adamantly oppose defunding the police. Thank you. And that has to be the last word. I want to thank all the candidates and my colleagues, Steve Missler and Mal Leary. You can see this debate in its entirety on demand at mainpublic.org anytime. Thank you from all of us here at Maine Public Broadcasting. Thank you to everybody at the Augusta Civic Center for hosting this debate tonight. I'm Jennifer Rooks for Steve Missler and Mal Leary. Good night. Local support for this program is provided by Maine Public Member Contributions and by... Memic, a workers' compensation insurance company celebrating more than 25 years of serving Maine employers and their employees. Dedicated to a balanced workers' compensation system that reduces injuries and keeps costs down. Memic.com. The Law Offices of Joe Bornstein. From Kittery to Caribou, the Joe Bornstein team is committed to serving injured and disabled Mainers in locations convenient to them. Learn more at JoeBornstein.com. AARP Maine, helping Mainers cast their votes safely and providing information about different voting options. Learn more at AARP.org slash Maine Votes.